Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Ave Maria Press Professional Development Webinar Series. Our goal in this series is to provide parish staff and volunteers and diocesan ministers the formation, training, and tools needed to create vibrant Catholic parishes and growing ministries. In today's webinar, Paul Jarzembowski will discuss the evangelizing opportunities of Ash Wednesday. My name is Erin Pierce. I am the Parish and Curriculum Marketing Specialist at Ave Maria Press. Before we begin our webinar, we would like to recognize our webinar partners, the National Conference for Catechetical Leadership, the National Association of Catholic Family Life Ministers, the National Association for Lay Ministry, and the Catholic Campus Ministry Association. Everyone in the audience is muted today, but you are able to ask questions. Questions may be sent to our presenter using the question section of the GoToWebinar panel, which you can see displayed here. And I'll read as many of those as possible at the end of the presentation today. This webinar is being recorded and a link to that recording will be sent to you later this week via email. With that, I would like to welcome and introduce our presenter today. Paul Jarzembowski is the lead staff for Youth and Young Adult, Young Adult Ministries at the USCCB in Washington, DC, serving in particular the Bishop's Committee on Laity, Marriage, Family Life, and Youth. In this role, he is also the National Coordinator for the United States engagement with World Youth Day and represents Catholic youth and young adult ministry in the US to the Holy See. Paul has consulted for and spoken in over 300 dioceses, parishes, universities, organizations, and conferences in the US, Canada, Latin America and the Caribbean, Europe, and the Vatican. Hailing from the Diocese of Gary in Indiana, Paul has served in pastoral ministry for over two decades in the Archdiocese of Chicago, the Diocese of Joliet, Loyola University Chicago, and now at the USCCB. Paul, thank you so much for being with us today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and pass the presenter mode over to you. I will close out my, my webcam and you can take it over. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's good to be with all of you today. Um, this title of this session um, has the word excitement and ashes, and it's probably not a common phraseology that one would think when thinking about Ash Wednesday or Lent. Um, excitement is kind of an unusual word, but when speaking about Lent, um, Ash Wednesday is perhaps one of the most exciting days of the year. And over the next couple of moments, uh, I hope you'll share that experience with me as to why it is so exciting. Um, in some respects, uh, we're, we're really in the, in the wake of uh, Pope Francis's exhortation. He's given us a foundation in this new document called Christus Vivit. Uh, Christus Vivit, Christ is Alive, um, is the apostolic exhortation on uh, youth and young adults. Um, it really focuses our attention as a church to be young again. Um, but I this is how it begins. And again, it begins with this notion of excitement. Christ is alive. He is our hope. And in a wonderful way, he brings youthfulness to our world and everything he touches becomes young, new, and full of life. So with that spirit of optimism and hope, um, the, the fact that we as a church must be alive, must uh, must be this sense of hope for young people. Um, I kind of want to start in that that style. Um, however, uh, I'm not uh, I'm not Pollyanna here. I also know that we we can't escape reality. Um, and one of the things that uh, Pope Francis says in Christus Vivit is that a reality that most of us are pretty well aware of that young people frequently fail to find in our usual programs a response to their concerns, their needs, their problems, and their issues. Um, much of our work, no matter how wonderful it is, and how exciting sometimes it may be, uh, is just not connecting with many youth and young adults. Um, they fail to really find a response uh, to their lived experiences most of the year. Um, and so what does, what does Pope Francis call us to do? So I, I, he says in many ways, 
uh, different strategies, different ideas throughout Christus Vivit, but I think it's summarized very simply in this, uh, this kind of exhortation to us as leaders. He says, I encourage communities to examine respectfully and seriously the situation of their young people in order to find the most fitting ways to provide them with pastoral care. So really right there, examining the situation and providing a response with pastoral care. Those are really our twofold uh, tasks, according to Christus Vivit. So uh, in order to really uh, be that joy of the gospel that Christus Vivit encourages us uh, to do. So, so let's quickly examine the situation. And many of you have been on webinars before, you might know some of the statistics, um, but uh, just as a reminder, uh, this is one of them that um, I believe is, uh, is indicative of, uh, of, of what we're going through. You see the trend lines of the measures of a Catholic lifestyle. And, and, and unfortunately, the trends are going to the, you know, uh, down. Um, you see especially church marriages are down. Um, you even see that funerals are down. And that doesn't mean that less people are dying. Um, it means that less people in their family communities are finding the church as a place to say goodbye to their loved ones. So more and more, uh, there is a, a decrease in that engagement. Um, while at the same time, uh, the green line um, has been relatively um, the same, uh, which is the Catholic population. So the Catholic population has not really changed all that much, but their marks of uh, those milestones in their life that they would uh, they would come to the church for are declining. Um, I think what this chart does is it kind of breaks the old adage, one day they'll come back. One day they'll come back when they're married, when they have kids. Um, one day they'll come back when they move back to the area. All of these these old adages we like to throw around perhaps in perhaps even dismissing our engagement with young people saying, let them sow their wild oats now, one day they'll be back for these major milestone events. And that's just simply not happening anymore. Um, there's the less and less of that is happening. Uh, we know that uh, disaffiliation is on the rise, that one third of young adults are disconnecting. Um, they're, they're checking out of church by age 13 and they're disappearing in their 20s and 30s. Um, note that in this particular study amongst uh, self-identified uh, Catholics. So these are people who self-identify. They're not the nuns. These are people who self-identify as Catholic still. Amongst the young people, which is the column to the far right, uh, you notice that only 14% come weekly to church. Um, so that is, that's kind of our baseline of sorts. Um, and, and it's a reminder, it's kind of a sobering reminder of the reality that we're confronted with. But Christus Vivit also challenges us. So he, Pope Francis says, anyone called to be a parent, pastor, and guide to young people must have farsightedness to appreciate the little flame that continues to burn, the fragile reed that is shaken but not broken, the ability to discern pathways where, only, where others only see walls, to recognize potential where others only see peril. In other words, we can be paralyzed. We can become cynical, judgmental about young people today looking at some of that data. Um, but we're called to be better than that. Um, if we're called to be a parent, a pastor, and a guide to young people, we must have farsightedness. We must have hope. Um, and for me, that is why after 20 years of doing this work, I still have a lot of hope. Those numbers for me do not uh, frighten me. They don't paralyze me. Um, and, it, uh, and it comes to the really the theme of where we're gathered here today. Um, I like to think that Ash Wednesday is that little flame that continues to burn, as Pope Francis says. Ash Wednesday in Lent gives me hope. I have seen many realities across this country. Um, I've seen it over the last two decades. Um, and the one thing where I am most excited about, again, sharing that excitement, is Ash Wednesday. And let me show you why. Again, this gets really exciting. So this chart, again, if you're you're probably thinking, oh my, he's showing statistics, how can I get excited about that? But just trust me, this is a really neat chart about, it, it's 52 lines showing uh, the attendance at church uh, in a given week, so the 52 weeks of the year. And you might notice the, the major spikes in attendance happen about three times a year. You see it to the far right, that's Christmas. Um, you see it uh, in the first third at Easter. And then you see Ash Wednesday as that third major bump. But 
if you think about it, what makes this day unique that Christmas and Easter don't have? It's unique because this is the one day a year where uh, this is one of those major holidays that they, many people come solo. They come by themselves to church. There isn't usually a family gathering attached to Easter Mass or Christmas Mass. Ash Wednesday is often experienced on their own. Um, so many people uh, come to church um, without prompting, without uh, that extra. They come because they want to. So that calls us to pay attention to that third, even though it is amongst the three top times of year that people will come to church, it is certainly a time that is unique amongst the others in that it's, uh, it's done uh, without other fanfare. So we need to pay attention. Other things that to me are worth considering. So remember that 14% uh, that come on a regular basis, the 14% of millennials, look, for instance, that come on a regular basis to church, that 14 becomes 41% on Ash Wednesday. So the same study, same group of people that are polled, 14 turns into 41 uh, on Ash Wednesday each year. That's, that's pretty significant. Um, and then 14% becomes 36% throughout the season of Lent. But when, people, when asked, do you give up anything? So 36% of millennials, uh, self-identified Catholics, will give up something, um, which as you can see across the, 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 this, uh, this chart, it's pretty average. Um, in fact, even better than perhaps some of their older, uh, older colleagues in the church. Um, so 36% uh, is, is, is doing pretty well for giving up things. But again, that was 14% for a weekly attendance. And then how many abstain from meat on Fridays? Fit, that 14% becomes 58% every Friday in Lent. These are statistical anomalies. These are things that um, that cause those who look at these numbers to, to pause because if the trend lines and Lenten practices reflect, you know, one would think they would reflect the same numbers that come out in the amount that come on a weekly basis to church, um, but they don't, they're an anomaly. Um, and you can see across this that this isn't really even just a young adult thing or, or a younger person's. It's a generational thing. There's an incredible power to Ash Wednesday, to abstaining from meat in Lent, to giving up things in Lent. There is an incredible amount of this. Um, and as I said, look at that chart. The 36% of millennials outnumbers the pre-Vatican II who are giving up things. So, um, so you see that this is an incredibly unique experience. And perhaps many of you have noticed this in Lent. You may have noticed this in your churches where uh, on Ash Wednesday, it is pretty crowded there. Uh, you might notice that when you talk to uh, young people, whether they practice or not, there's, there's probably a, a, a veering towards getting that fish uh, on Friday or, or, or having, having pasta on Friday. There's, there's just something to it. So you may have noticed this even your own anecdotal experience uh, through the years. So I guess the big question is why? Why do they return? Um, people have been there, there and, and I will tell you, there isn't one particular reason, but a couple have been uh, have been raised and, and just to kind of go through them. Um, I, the, when I oftentimes will ask people about this, the first thing that may might say is, well, it's Catholic guilt. And that may have been true for past generations, but not so much for younger people today. Um, they don't possess that sense of Catholic guilt, perhaps that their uh, exer or boomer or older uh, parents and grandparents may have felt. Um, millennials and Gen Zers do not necessarily feel that Catholic guilt in the same way. However, there is something about belonging, and uh, which I guess is kind of a variation on the Catholic guilt. It is kind of the it's the notion of be, there's a physical experience, the, the ashes, for instance, mark you as part of a community. You belong to something bigger. And young people want to belong to something. Uh, they want to feel that they are welcomed, that they are a part of something else, something bigger. So there could be a little bit of that. It, the accessible spirituality, what do I mean by that? Well, the word here is spirituality. Lent is an incredibly spiritual season. Um, it's a very accessible spiritual season in the sense that if you're spiritual but not religious, if you're somebody who doesn't practice on a regular basis, Lent and Ash Wednesday feel like that's something that they can enter into that's a little easier than other Catholic or Christian rituals. 
So it's a little more excessive and it's a very spiritual time of year. Um, during Lent, if you, you, you notice that we really focus a lot on the life of Christ. Um, think about when do they show movies about the life of Jesus on regular network television or on cable shows. Uh, it's during the Lenten season. Um, we're about Jesus then. And I think that there's a uh, young people today, um, even if they have a disconnect from the practice of the faith, they still love Jesus. And so there's an accessible spirituality to the person of Christ. And so that's there. There's moderate commitment involved with Lent. Um, now, some may say and they get cynical about young people today that they don't like to commit to anything. I've talked to many young people and, and oftentimes they'll say, I feel overcommitted. So it's quite the opposite of, of, of avoiding commitment. Um, but they're looking for commitments that they, can, that they won't fail at, uh, that they won't feel that, that if they don't do a good job that they have somehow failed in this world. So Lent is a short-term, manageable, doable commitment. Uh, maybe if it's going to Ash Wednesday each year, it's a, it's a day. If it's the Fridays in Lent, if it's a 40 days. But all of those are short, they're, they're doable, they're manageable. They feel that they could accomplish it without failing at something. And that's very attractive. So I think that there is something to be said about moderate commitment. Um, renewal or resolution. Um, Ash Wednesday takes place, Lent takes place in um, the winter months, or it starts in the winter months at least. It moves us into spring, but it, winter is a time where there's a lot of great introspection, and people are looking to uh, resolve to do something different. They're thinking inwardly. Um, one could argue that it might be like a New Year's resolution uh, part two. Um, uh, maybe uh, this time with the church and with Jesus on my side, I might be able to accomplish this resolution. So it's a time of renewal for them sometimes. Um, there's a tradition and identity. Um, this is a time of, of year also that young people feel most connected to the Catholic experience. There's something about the tradition of ashes and fasting that is appealing um, to many young people. Um, it's a time where they can identify, they can feel at home. This is this feels like home. Maybe, maybe grandmother or mother took us to Ash Wednesday or they, they we took we went to fish fries or they went to a spaghetti dinner. So there's something, there's a family tradition, there's a faith tradition, uh, there's an identity that makes you feel that this is the Catholic thing to do. Another reason people give um, is, uh, is is the notion of forgiveness and mercy. Um, many young people today are, are very self-aware. They're, they're aware of their imperfections. Um, I said before that they're afraid of failing. Um, many of them know that they're flaws. And so they are looking for some sort of mercy, for some sort of forgiveness, for a start over. Um, and uh, Lent is that time of year when the church says it's okay to be messed up. Um, and it's okay. We forgive you. Let's start anew. So there is that attraction to that. And this last one sometimes gets overlooked, but I want to spend a few moments on this. Uh, that is that notion of peace, rest, and refuge. Um, many young people today are feeling, they're struggling, they're be feeling overwhelmed, and they're looking for some place to find refuge, some place to find that peace that they seek, some place where, where the noise can just stop for a moment. And Lent is a time of year where even as a church, we are much more quiet, we're much more introspective, we're much more peaceful. And so that experience of church for someone who perhaps is, uh, you know, coming to it for the first time in a while is very attractive. And so there is that attractability to it. And just to get a little more detail as to what I mean by that, here's an example, for instance, of uh, a stress levels. Um, so this was a study done a couple of years ago on how stressed are people in this world. And you can see that uh, millennials, uh, especially, um, are very high stressed. There is a lot of stress in their lives. Um, so they're looking for a refuge from that stress. Um, some big young adult stressors, 42% say that debt is their biggest concern. 39% um, say that they are overwhelmed with debt compared to 23% of boomers saying it. And 56 say they live, more than half say they live paycheck to paycheck and thus unable to save for the future. So that type of stress is very big in their lives. And one might argue, well, what does this have to do with Lent? What does this have to do with the liturgical season, with the evangelization? 
it has to do with a lot. This is what is occupying the mental space, the spiritual space of many young people that come to us. We think oftentimes that young people are, you know, uh, carefree, um, but this is, they're actually, they're actually incredibly overwhelmed. Uh, this is a huge thing. Um, there was an article in America Magazine that uh, just this month on the gig economy, that is uh, living that paycheck to paycheck, uh, not sure, making some, you know, trying to find three jobs to fit together to at least pay the rent. Um, that young people, that that's affecting their spirituality um, and that they feel that there's no one who's really responding. Christus Vivid even says this, says, at sometimes, and this is throughout the synodal process that led up to Christus Vivit, this is what was heard. Pope Francis says that times he heard that the hurt felt by some young people was heartrending, a pain too deep for words. They can only tell God how much they are suffering and how hard it is for them to keep going since they no longer believe in anyone. It is, in a way, um, a silent killer. Um, uh, debt and and this notion of feeling overwhelmed so soon in life that will it ever get better? Um, studies show that these generations now are going to probably do be worse off economically than their parents, and that hurts. Um, and knowing that that where is the future go from here? Um, that there's no one to go to oftentimes. Um, that they can only tell God. So. I, I just present this as because when I read this passage from Christus Vivit, I thought immediately, is that is this what the young people, the young adults in the pews on Ash Wednesday, or the young adults who are more engaged on uh, it, on Fridays in Lent or throughout the Lenten season, is this what's going through their heads? While they're sitting in the pews on Ash Wednesday, is this what they're experiencing? And how can the church respond? So... I'd like to think that we have a new normal. Again, those original measures of Catholic lifestyle, um, which were uh, that they would come back one day for marriage or getting their kids baptized is not necessarily, those milestones aren't necessarily happening, but they do come back for key moments. Um, and I think that we, the Ash Wednesday and Lent are perhaps the biggest of these, but there are others too. We find this in studies when we, we look at uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe or Corpus Christi, especially in some of the southern states. Um, we have, you have friends' weddings, not necessarily their own weddings, but weddings of friends who are maybe active in their faith or who are getting married in a church. That's when they will return for a friend's wedding or perhaps the funeral of a family member. Um, they'll come back perhaps for some cultural uh, touchstones and their, whatever in their particular uh, ethnic culture might be uh, have a connection to faith. They might come back for that for a day, for a week, or however long it might be. Um, crisis moments are another moment that they'll return, but they're momentary. Uh, they don't last long. Um, they'll often come for that one thing, and if there's no engagement at that point, they will simply skip off. That is our new normal, um, and it's something to be realized. Uh, Pope Francis realizes that in Christus Vivid, he says, because of that, it is important to make the most of the great moments of the liturgical year. He mentions Holy Week, Pentecost, Christmas, but other festive occasions can provide a welcome break in their routine and help them to experience the joy of faith. Again, going back to that notion, their routine right now is the cycle of pain, the cycle of feeling overwhelmed. And can Lent, can Ash Wednesday, can the church then through those feasts help them experience joy, what often they're lacking the most in? Now, if you think about the readings on Ash Wednesday, it's even, it, it gets even more exciting. Um, so consider the first reading. The first reading uh, from the prophet Joel uh, speaks about the exiles returning from Babylon to Jerusalem. Um, and so it's that coming back to the temple, coming back to that practice of faith after being gone for so long. So in a way, that's not too dissimilar to our experience of young adults who are coming back to the church for that one moment. So again, think about that. So if you're looking from spiritually, what do young people hear? What do we hear? Yet and even, even now says the Lord, return to me with your whole heart, etc. But then he also is kind of pointing the finger at us as those who are already in the pews and says, blow a trumpet Zion, 
proclaim a fast, call an assembly, gather the people, notify the congregation. You can feel the excitement in Joel's voice when he says this, and perhaps uh, thinking ahead to your whoever's lecturing on Ash Wednesday, think about that phrase and, and, and speak that phrase with the excitement that Ash Wednesday is, because it is a, it is a moment for the church to get excited, excited and to proclaim this to everyone, to let everyone know that this is happening. The second reading gets even better. The second reading, um, it's up to us, those who are active in our faith, to be ambassadors for Christ. Um, and then to the, the, the third line or fourth line you see on the, on the screen, to not receive the grace of God in vain. <clears throat> we have received a grace in the fact that young people return to our churches each year, but we often receive it in vain. We often, sit, we often perhaps get cynical. Oh, it's about time you showed up. You took my favorite parking spot. You took my favorite pew. Um, or we, we, we dismiss them as, well, they're just lazy and they only want to come for their ashes. Maybe, you know, we'll, we won't see you again for another, another 12 months. If we, re if we receive the grace that is these visitors, that is these people who are coming to our church for a moment in vain, um, I God is saying, no, we have to, he is appealing to us. Um, and now is the acceptable time. Now is the time we must act. Um, so, um, I just, I, I, I share these readings because in a way it's, it's speaking to us as people who are in the pews already, uh, and also speaking to them. So what can we do? Let's get to the practical aspects of the, what can we do? Um, I think that there's three stages uh, in terms of what we can do. The first is before uh, Lent begins. There's a stage there. There's on Ash Wednesday and through the season of Lent. And then the third is that beyond, what happens as we continue on. So if we look at these three stages, I think that's a good way of kind of uh, exploring this. So let's get into it. Before Lent. Um, so the first thing, you know how Joel said, notify the congregation. So in this sense, we're doing that, prepare the community. So the first thing is to pray for the young people, pray, pray for young adults who are coming. So before they get there, perhaps in the weeks leading up to Lent, maybe spend time each Sunday, maybe during daily mass, maybe during the weekend masses, to pray for those who will be coming to us, um, to just get us in the mindset of praying for them. Um, to reflect on the local situation, reflect on why might young people find uh, a connection to church during the Lenten season? What is it about our local economy? What is going on in our community? Um, is there violence in the area that they need refuge from? Reflect on their reality. Like Pope Francis says, we have to examine the situation. So examine the situation in your community. And I don't just mean your parish community, but the geographical community around. Learn about the best evangelization techniques. What is a good way to start conversations? What are, what are ways to form relationships with young people? Um, we need to learn these skills, um, and they are skills. Um, uh, it doesn't sometimes come easy for all of us. So we have to learn how to engage people. So that's part of the learning. And then investing. You know, if again, if, if we ask ourselves, why aren't young people invested in the church? question is, is, is the church investing in them? And that does mean, how are we investing our ministries to engage young people? Um, if you're on this webinar and you're already, if, if the church invested in young people through your ministry, through your, as a staff person or as somebody who's been uh, been authorized and, 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 and sent to mission to young people, excellent. But are there ways that it can further invest in the uh, youth and young adults? Um, and if you just work with youth, again, Young adults is one huge population that this is about. So how are we investing in young adults in their 20s and 30s uh, when they are often coming back for that one moment? Secondly, intentional planning. And that, that key word, intentionality. Um, I think we often, when we think about Lent and Ash Wednesday, we do what we've always done. Every, every year we roll out the, you know, what, the purple banners, uh, we get the ashes ready, uh, we do the normal routine. But how can we be a little more intentional about our planning to make Ash Wednesday and Lent even better this year? So do we think long and hard about, uh, about what can we do differently? So it's about being intentional in that. And in the next slide, I'll, uh, we'll share a little bit about some plans you can make for that day. But the key thing is before Lent, how intentional and long-term can we plan beforehand? 
in some respect for this Ash Wednesday, it's in a couple of weeks. Ideally, in a, in a year, start planning three, four, five months in advance of Ash Wednesday for this experience. So you can really think through the strategies of engaging young adults through uh, Ash Wednesday, through the season of Lent and beyond. And then finally, uh, before Lent, uh, invite. Now you might be saying, our church is already crowded, why should I invite any more? Well, you saw the number, only 41% are coming on Ash Wednesday. Wouldn't it be great if that 41 was 51, 61, 81, 100% of people are coming back on Ash Wednesday? Um, it's great that we are attracting more than the 14, but we can always do more. I like to think of that parable in the scriptures of the guys who are cutting the hole in the roof to lay, to bring down their, their paralytic friend to see Jesus. Can we get to an Ash Wednesday where they have to literally cut a hole in the roof of our church so we can get in there? That's how full we want it to be, and even then some. And if you're saying we can't fit everybody in the church, then have another service, have another mass. Um, there's always an, an economy of abundance that's around. So um, if, you, if you say, how many people can fit on the table, get a bigger table. So invite people, invite friends, and who do you know? Um, who is not at the table normally? Are there friends, you know, are you as ministers, you might know people who might need to be invited to Ash Wednesday and Lent. Um, again, if it's something where they're, if you know somebody who's disconnected from the church, this is a time of year where we can help, where we can, where we can walk through the struggle with you. So encounter and invite people beforehand. What can we do on Ash Wednesday? So the day itself, the day has come, again, you wake up, this is the exciting day because the, the floodgates are open and people are going to come in. So the first thing, radical hospitality. Welcome, welcome them at the door. Consider, consider maybe even, I, it might be, depending on your situation, it might be corny, but you know, name, name badges so you can actually call someone by name. Young people want to belong and sometimes just simply calling them by their name uh, is something that would be, go a long way, that radical hospitality of making sure that they feel welcome from the moment they get into your parking lot to the moment they leave, make them feel at home. Explain, that's part of hospitality too. We assume that everyone, well, everyone knows what's going on. No, not everyone knows what's going on. They do it perhaps out of, they, 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 because either of their tradition, it's a commitment, but do they really know what it's about? You might consider having like a pamphlet, for instance, in the in the pews, a small pamphlet that explains what do ashes mean, what does Lent mean, maybe even what do the stained glass windows around our church mean, uh, why is the church designed in this way? Simple, easy to read explanations while they're waiting for church to start, while they're you know going out, they can take it with them to explain a little bit about what they're about to experience. Um, in that little brochure, perhaps, you can even say you are more than welcome. If you haven't been to church in a while, please come up for ashes and then join us perhaps later for something. And we'll get to that in a moment. But explain, uh, explain a little bit. And then um, connect, um, have a conversation with them. Don't be afraid, again, of that radical hospitality of just simply uh, engaging with somebody. Uh, saying, how are you doing? Where are you from? Um, I, you know, forgive me. Um, I, I may not have, you know, explained to them, hey, I, maybe I wasn't here last week. I didn't see you, but who are you? Uh, and, or, or what's your name? And, and, and it's good to meet you. Connect with them. Have, a, have a, a literal conversation beside just handshaking them into church and welcoming them, uh, if that, but to have a conversation. Um, again, this is an exciting day. Make, that, make Ash Wednesday a day of radical hospitality. Make the space sacred. This is some place that many of them are coming for that refuge and that rest. So how is the prayer experience uh, an, an encounter with that uh, transcendent reality? Um, how is the music? Um, what, does the, what does the environment look like? Is it inviting? Does it feel transcendent? Does it feel like some place that can be a place of refuge? What words do we use? What prayers? Consider very simply how, what prayers of the faithful. Who are we praying for? Those are ways to convey to uh, young adults on Ash Wednesday that we take serious their concerns. So perhaps during the prayers of the faithful, pray for issues, pray for them uh, in the prayers of the faithful. If you, um, if you're the preacher, if you are the priest or deacon or or the or, or the person giving a reflection on that day, what words will you use? 
um, make them words of hospitality, make them words of appreciation and love. Um, but but what is the? How can that space be sacred in all of the aspects of the liturgy? So that does involve some intentional planning ahead of time. You you may need to do some things. You can't just put together what you've done for the last 10 years at your parish. It may be something you need to do special to make it more sacred. And then make it an engaging evening. Um, different than Christmas and Easter, you can do a post-event um, uh, fellowship afterwards, for instance. Um, do something, perhaps a soup and conversation. Of course, it's a, it's a day of fasting, so of course you don't need to have a feast, but perhaps a simple soup supper with some conversation, some dialogue. Uh, invite people to come and join you afterwards. Um, so if it's a 7 p.m. mass or service, stay afterwards, so eight o'clock, maybe eight to nine, uh, gather around, uh, have some, again, have some meatless treats uh, for people to, to join and have that fellowship. Um, it's a great time to get names and addresses of people um, so that you can uh, have that conversation afterwards. So, uh, so have an engaging evening. Make Ash Wednesday, make that night. Um, oftentimes, you know, again, different than Christmas and Easter, there's no brunch or presents to unwrap afterwards. So people, not that I know of that, most people don't have an Ash Wednesday present exchange, but if, you know, so most won't. So you can perhaps invite them to stay on a little longer. And if they've had radical hospitality, if they felt a transcendent sacred space there, they're one that can, can keep hanging uh, in that environment. <clears throat> so these are some things you can do on Ash Wednesday itself. So what can you do in journeying and accompanying them throughout Lent? So there's a couple of things. Um, you can help your, and this was this might require some of your pre-Lenten preparation, but equipping your families to have dialogue at home afterwards, having a conversation around the dinner table. Um, follow up with people. Um, people are always looking for mentors and guides in the community. Um, and if you have, if you do have an opportunity to get their contact information, um, follow up with them and have that conversation. Um, be a mentor, be a witness, um, share your experience in conversations with them afterwards. So uh, continue that dialogue. Um, since many of the reasons why um, young, young adults do come and engage in the season of Lent is because of the need for refuge, uh, the fact that they're overwhelmed, provide some pastoral care and support um, throughout the season. When we think of Lent, we think of some of the liturgical programs or perhaps a retreat in Lent or a reconciliation service, but are there other pastoral care uh, options for people who are dealing with economic issues, people who are dealing with mental health issues, uh, people who are dealing with physical health issues, um, uh, issues related to relationships with career, with identity? Um, all of those issues are, are swimming in the worlds uh, that young adults are dealing with. So how can the season of Lent be a season of pastoral care and support? Um, that, is, that is essentially what Christus Vivit, what Pope Francis is challenging the church to do, is to be more pastoral. Um, so how can it be a place of dialogue? How can it be a place of help where they can feel listened to and feel comforted and feel the sense of rest and refuge that the church really is called to be? Um, one of the favorite scripture passages I like to think about to meditate on during the season of Lent is Matthew 11:28. 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Think and pray on that passage and how can your parish, how can you personally offer more pastoral care and support during the season of Lent? Not just another program, not just another event, but how can you offer what young people are really looking for, a response to their needs, their concerns. The very thing Pope Francis said in Christus Vivit that the church has sometimes failed to provide, Lent can be that opportunity. They're giving us a chance. So let's give them the chance to feel this sense of rest and refuge. And then community engagement. Um, if they are connecting, if they feel a sense of community, um, help them with their spiritual journey. Help form them for those who wanna know more about the faith. Uh, help them put into action over the 40 days some of the things for which your community may be excited to do. So these are all ways in which throughout the season, now we, this is not rocket science. I'm not telling you probably anything new, but using Lent as a time to really double down on many of these things 
uh, will certainly be illuminating. Here's just a few practical ideas that I have seen done uh, throughout the season uh, that you might consider. So having dialogue or listening sessions with young people, um, if they've given us the opportunity of their time, um, many times they, they tell us, I don't feel listened to by the church. So listen to them. So maybe have a special dialogue or listening session. That might be something you can do on Ash Wednesday night, or maybe at some other time during the Lenten season. Um, but having those listening sessions, letting young people know that they're, they're listened to. A mentoring program. Um, you know, one of the areas that throughout the synodal process we learned is that young people are craving mentors. They're craving spiritual guides. Um, are, there, um, are there opportunities in your parish that you can match up uh, young adults with an adult in the community, maybe somebody who shares their career or uh, is in their, like lives down the block from them or uh, is engaged, has a similar interests, um, social interests or personal interests. Um, so are there ways that you can have a mentoring type program throughout the season of Lent to match people up and feel that they have, they have someone in the community? Um, the rice bowl, we often think of that as something to do with children, but many young adults might uh, find that to be a very, again, it's a moderate, it's an accessible type of spiritual practice that helps people understand a very practical way of, per, you know, with that little rice bowl of putting funds in to support the poor, to support the marginalized, um, which are very near and dear to many young people's hearts. So how can there be ways that um, you can use the rice bowl, for instance, as, uh, as a means to engage young adults? Stations and socials, you know, the, you have uh, four, five, six Fridays in Lent that uh, have often have Stations of the Cross. Um, it's a great weekly experience. And we all know, again, that young adults are, uh, are giving up something on Friday. So Friday for them is a good day to maybe rally them together, maybe after work. Um, having young people engaged in the stations, uh, if they want to lead um, or if they just want to attend, uh, you might say, maybe if you have the contact information of a number of young adults, uh, experiencing stations at different churches in your community that are nearby. You may consider, and then afterwards you can, you know, have that social, that, that, that fellowship afterwards. Um, and I can attest from personal experience. Um, I even met my wife through one of these, uh, at one of these experiences. So um, there are some other fringe benefits. Um, a Lenten young adult retreat. Uh, is uh, another thing, of course, that, that need for silence, that need for peace and refuge. Uh, create, having a, if you're going to do a young adult retreat any time of year, Lent is a great time to do it. Volunteer service, uh, letting young people engage in mission uh, is good. Digital Lenten experiences is another idea. The, um, many young people say that they're often too busy. Uh, they don't have much time to come to the church for events or programs, but they might have five or ten minutes in their day um, if your church's social media or website or um, through their email list, you might have a way to um, have a, a, a maybe a digital uh, retreat or a, a, once a day you might have a reflection that you can share online. Maybe your pastor, maybe a pastoral associate at your, uh, at your parish or your community can offer um, some sort of digital retreat once a day uh, in the seasonal or once a week or however you might want to do it. But using uh, the digital world to engage with young adults is another way. So even if they tell you, I'm too busy to come to church, that's fine. We'll come to you in that digital sphere. Um, and, and, and actually, while I'm at that, actually, the notion of going to them is also very key. It's not, you know, we always think about them coming to church and they do come to church on Ash Wednesday and Lent. But throughout Lent, are there ways that we can go to them as well? How can we enter their world? Um, are there places in your community where, where young adults gather? Um, on a more frequent basis, how can you be present in their reality, not just expect them to come to our reality? So Lent is a good time for as a community, that's one Lenten practice we can commit to, is going into their space. The digital world is one of those spaces, there are many others. Candlelight and silence, you know, using that to our advantage. Um, <clears throat> I spoke before about a family dinner dialogue, having some tools for how do we, how to express at the table. Um, as winter moves to spring, there's more outdoor opportunities that can happen throughout the later part of the season of Lent. So having some sort of mission in the neighborhood for ecology, 
young people have expressed throughout the synodal process how concerned they are about uh, ecological change, climate change, and so um, Lent would be a great opportunity to uh, engage in a, some sort of either local or maybe global mission. Uh, this particular year is the fifth anniversary of Laudato Si, and it's the 50th Earth Day that we've ever had, so there might be some particular uh, activities in your community that young adults might uh, find um, attractive, so Lent could be a good time to do that, and as the weather warms up, what a great opportunity. Lenten pilgrimages um, could be another thing. Um, as I said, going to different churches for stations, maybe going just to other churches to explore the transcendent of different uh, spiritual spaces. If there's a pilgrimage site in your area, that's a great time to do it. Uh, the idea of pilgrimage is very popular. World Youth Day, for instance, is uh, is a very popular experience for youth and young adults um, because that that pilgrimage uh, that pilgrimage experience of prayer is very attractive to young people who are always on the move and going. Um, that's our liturgical way of being on the move and going. So, are there ways throughout Lent you can do that? And then perhaps the the pilgrimage that uh, that we can all um, be a part of is Holy Week. Um, the, the kind of the, the finale of Lent, um, Holy Week is a great time of year to uh, to engage young adults, um, especially like Holy Thursday and Good Friday. Um, there's such drama in those feasts that uh, we can you can use that as opportunities to uh, get people together. Um, in one of the dioceses I used to serve in, we used to on Holy Thursday uh, gather, invite all the young adults to the cathedral for um, a um, for Holy Thursday Mass, and then afterwards uh, go to seven different churches before midnight. We called it a midnight pilgrimage. It sounded very unique for those who were disconnected from the church. They didn't know what it was, but it sounded cool. So they came to church, and then they went on a pilgrimage of the seven churches. It was a very popular event, um, but that was just some one way to, uh, to really tap into the drama of Holy Week, um, which for many young people who are coming back, it's part of that tradition that they might uh, be longing for. So, so these are just a few ideas. There are probably many others. But programs, um, it's not just about the programs. And so in all of these, Pope Francis says that we have to use the language of closeness, the language of a generous relational and existential love that touches the heart, impacts life, and awakens hopes and desires. Young people need to be approached with the grammar of love, not by being preached at. The language that young people understand is spoken by those who radiate life, by those who are there for them and with them. They want that, so it's, they want that accompaniment. So it's not, again, not just programs, it's our attitude. It's how do we, how are we in relation to young people? Those programs, you can do those, you can do anything else, but as long as it is there for them and with them, um, that is what essentially is going to draw them in, not how great the program is, but at that program, how are we expressing the grammar of love? How are we there for them and with them? Um, even if it seems, and, and, and this is the thing, um, waste time on young adults. Pope Francis speaks a lot about wasting time. And I would argue to waste time on young adults. Many people sometimes think young people are a lost cause. What's, one, what's, what's, a, what's journeying with one person throughout the season of Lent going to really do? It will do everything one person at a time. If all you can do this Lent is accompany one person from Ash Wednesday to Easter Sunday and beyond, you have done more than you can possibly do. If you do two, three, however many, but even as, even as much as just one person, all that matters is to be there for them and with them. So I, I end with an Ash Wednesday challenge. How will you in your community use Ash Wednesday and Lent to approach young adults with the grammar of love? How will you use such opportune moments as Ash Wednesday and Lent? What are you going to do? Um, and I want you also to know that you're not alone. Um, the Ash Wednesday experience is experienced across the world. It's not just the United States thing. Um, it's actually experienced not even in, in Catholic culture, but in other Christian communities as well. Um, there is such, there's a, there's a, there's such a transcendence to the whole Ash Wednesday experience, the Lenten experience, that it, it transcends uh, denominational, national, ethnic lines. Um, so you are not alone in this reality, um, and you're also not alone in responding. So um, if, if you and your parish and your community do something 
know that there are people around the country, around the world who are also taking this challenge as well. And I encourage you to challenge others in other communities to what are they gonna do this Ash Wednesday in Lent, not just to uh, make it a season of fasting uh, and almsgiving and penance, but to also make it a season of excitement when young people, young adults are back in the church and are engaged with us. Um, so I, I think that there is a challenge to be done and I think you're up for that challenge. I look forward to hearing what the next great ideas will be. So, um, so know that you have my prayers for a truly exciting Ash Wednesday in Lent, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions or thoughts you might have. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, yes, I encourage everyone now, um, if you haven't already, to go ahead and um, share a question with us. Um, I find this incredibly fascinating, Paul, that it is Ash Wednesday that brings so many people, uh, young people, young adults, back to the church, and what a great opportunity we have um, you know, in, in our hands, placed in our laps. So so thank you, and thank you for um, these great ideas. It would be interesting also to hear from those who are, you know, attending right now what they are already doing to make mm -hmm. Ash Wednesday a real um, transcendent experience. Um, Michael asks, could the spike in Ash Wednesday attendance be an identifying trend? In other words, it's a rare time that one might be identified outwardly as a Catholic. Is there a kind of social pressure to identify as Catholic in this way? I don't think that, again, that gets back to that notion of Catholic guilt. I don't, I, I think past generations that may have been true. I think with younger generations today, I don't feel there is that pressure. Um, now perhaps in certain community, I mean, again, every, every young person is going to be unique. Um, but I think by and large, we can't assume that there is this uh, pressure um, uh, to feel a part of something. But it is an identity, like you, he is, Michael's right, it is an identifying trait. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it, it makes people feel that they belong, uh, that they belong to something bigger than uh, their office, their, their, their small group of friends, their, they belong to something bigger. And I think that's what's attractive. I don't know if it's a pressure to feel that way, but it is a blessing to feel a part of something bigger. I love going into the grocery store after Ash Wednesday and seeing everybody, <laughs> you know, with their ashes. It, oh, it does. It makes you feel like you are part of a of a greater community. Um, Laura asked, what are the drawbacks to meeting at a local restaurant or coffee shop? So perhaps she's maybe referring to the the whole mentoring and support. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Drawbacks, um, not much. Um, I think that again, what you're doing in those environments is going to them. So, um, so after, um, like for instance, if it's after the Ash Wednesday service, if you have some place nearby that you all want to meet up for, that's great. If you do stations and want to meet up afterwards at a local community or local place in the community, a, a coffee house, Starbucks, a, a bar, whatever it might be, you know, closest to you or fits your community, great. Um, even if it's just for the individual meetings throughout Lent. Um, yeah, go into their community. If there's the draw. I mean, if there is a drawback, um, it's if we don't take advantage of them, of course, inviting them to something else and, and continuing that process of relationship with them to invite them to experience other um, other forms of community. Um, certainly in, in their setting would be wonderful, but um, never leave the coffee house, never leave the bar with somebody without also without there being something coming next. Where else will you come? So if that means another coffee house, or if that means come meet me at the church on Sunday, wherever it is on their journey, um, the only drawback would be if you don't make the invitation afterwards. Karen said, asks, can you expound on the phrase grammar of love? Are there special phrases you would suggest, or is it more of a conversational tone of open questions to find out what are their pain points, their pressure points to help them through? No, I think she hits right on it. It's when I the use the way I've interpreted Pope Francis's phrase, the grammar of love, um, is to speak with a compassionate heart. I think that um, when we speak about young adults, um, it's speaking about them with a sense of compassion and understanding. Um, uh, like for instance, if they don't show up for, let's say, let's say somebody says, well, I haven't been to church in, 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 in six weeks. Um, the, the grammar of love is saying, 
is there something going on in your life that that you know are, are you struggling with something or are you feeling overwhelmed is life too busy assuming the assuming the best never never set the, approaching the opposite would be approaching with the grammar of 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 judgment or approaching with the grammar of suspicion oh i suspect you're not here because of this but to always ask is there something else deeper um, because oftentimes when when people aren't as connected with a with a faith tradition or they don't practice um, it's often if you dig deep enough it's it there is some something there but if somebody doesn't approach them with a sense of compassion we'll never know what that thing is and we'll just talk about the surface level um, and they may not be able to articulate even what it is but if we engage them I think with a sense of awe and wonder uh, a sense of of uh, understanding of forgiveness I, I think that instead of a pro that's what I think the, the the grammar of love is is uh, in anything we do with young adults be compassionate and assume the best and you know what if I if 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 I have to meet the pearly gates and I you know if God accuses me for assuming the best of too many people I'd rather have that against me than assuming the worst so um, I, I think you can't go wrong assuming the best Maybe you'll be made a fool of, but I'd rather be a fool for compassion and love of Christ than, than approaching everyone with a sense of cynicism or, ah, I, I'm, you know, I, I, this is what I really think you're going through. It's easy to slip into that. I've done it, but approaching people with a compassionate, with, a, with that grammar, I think that's what, that's what Pope Francis is getting at. How would you suggest or what are some tips to get the congregation on board with that type of mindset versus, oh, they're sitting in my pew? Yeah. You know, <laughs> um, you know and this is a, this is a process. And in if you're in some respects, you might want to try a few things this Ash Wednesday. But this is why I say it might need five or six months of preparation because you're going to need that time to prepare the community. It might mean strategically talking, finding parish council might need, you know, you might need to talk to them and say, how are there ways to share with the community these best practices, these, this awareness, um, you know, talking to the pastor, talking to particular ministry leaders. Um, you might have to do it ministry by ministry. So for instance, the DRE and the ministry with catechists or families might be a particular type of, of outreach for this, which you may have to do something different than with the seniors ministry or perhaps uh, with the youth ministry or whatever ministry. So it, approaching each of the ministries in the parish might be a, a process. Um, there's, you know, I mean, I doubt there's a community out there where you could, after this webinar, get up this Sunday and say, hey, everybody, I've got a new thing. Everyone, let's get on board. And then in three weeks, they're all going to be on board. It's probably not going to happen. Um, so I would say it's a, it's a gradual approach. I would try some things this year because if you haven't th thought of this already and you want to try something, try a few little, tease a few things out this uh, this Lenten season. And then in the next Lenten season, take the six to five to four months ahead of time and engage with your pastoral council, your parish leaders, your parish staff, your volunteers, uh, and approach it in that systematic way. It, it's going to require some ebb and flow and you're going to have some successes and you're going to have some failures, but that's okay. It's a risk worth trying. Absolutely. Um, Linda said, not a question, but an observation. Great opportunity to evangelize. My daughter invited a non-Catholic friend to Ash Wednesday last year. Yeah. Something we all could do is invite someone to, to attend with us. Yes. Sure. Um, and then Teresa says, as a millennial, thank you so much for this excellent and thoughtful presentation. Can you offer some suggestions for how to recruit or train mentors? Oh, yeah. Me that's a whole other webinar. <laughs> um, and I say that only because it's a it's a process. Um, uh, I think part of it is identifying, first of all, um, it's making people aware of the need for mentorship. Um, and then, uh, you know, identifying a few people who are willing to step into those roles. Um, which again might require again like with the other process you may have to engage with certain ministries in the parish parish councils etc to be able to find ways to collect names and see who what people want to be linked up to um a, a potential model and a quick answer uh, a potential model we have is rcia and marriage preparation in some communities they have sometimes a sponsor couple parish or a mentor couple or there is the sponsor for rcia 
how like how does that work how do people get those sponsors um, you might want to use that as a model for a general sense of mentorship um, because I think that that those are I think a few things that we have used that culture of mentorship to do it well um, those can continually be improved but maybe steal a little bit from that and again this this may this is a longer kind of process which may require more detail and, and nuance mm -hmm. That's a great idea, though. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you um, for all of these really thoughtful questions and, Paul, for your time that you have spent with us today. Um, the webinar is being recorded. As I said earlier, we will send you all an email with the link, and um, we'll also include the PowerPoint that Paul is graciously sharing with us. So thank you so much. Um, please join us next week with um, Julia Dazelski, also of the U.S. CCB will discuss ways to implement Christus Vivit with our families, so ministering to youth and families. Um, so um, we're going to get all of the ministries uh, addressed here. Um, right. So join us at three o'clock. Again, thank you so much, and everybody have a great, great afternoon. Bye-bye.